Today's lesson is going to discuss some applications of nuclear energy. And so if you haven't had a chance to look at the earlier lessons about nuclear chemistry, such as nuclear transmutations or half-life problems, I strongly recommend that you look at that uh, before uh, moving on to this lesson. And so the first application that we're going to discuss is nuclear fission. And this is defined as when a very heavy nucleus splits into a more stable nucleus of a small mass. And so normally it's is a, a, one very large nucleus becoming two or more nuclei that are much, much smaller. Uh, and so per perhaps the way that we can illustrate that is if you see a window, you want to break the window. Well, you start with a large object and you're breaking it into smaller pieces. That's what fission is. So some applications of fission are examples where you'd see this would be in nuclear power plants, for example. This is where fission is taking place, usually with uranium, sometimes with uh, a plutonium or, or some other uh, fissionable um, material. Also, fission was used in the very early nuclear weapons. Uh, so, for example, in the 1940s, those nuclear uh, bombs that, that ended World War II, in Japan, for example, those were fission bombs. Now the actual reaction that takes place in fission looks something like this. This is a sample, one of, of several reactions that could take place. And this is where you have some uranium, and you might notice that specifically this is uranium-235. And so normally we consider that the other main isotope of uranium, which is uranium-238, is normally not uh, very useful for this purpose. It really needs to be uranium-235. Well, notice that uranium-235 does not undergo fission, generally speaking, just by itself. We have to hit it with a neutron. That's what this is. 1 over 0 n is a neutron. And it's like if we go back to that example of breaking a window again, if you want to break the window, you can't just sit around and hope that, that window is going to break on its own. It's probably, probably not going to happen. You have to throw a rock at it. And so that's what the neutron is. We're throwing this neutron at the uranium atom, and that's what causes it to split. And so you'll notice that we're making two smaller nuclei. This is krypton-93, and we're also making an atom of uh, barium-140. But that's not it. You'll notice that we're making three other particles, and the three particles that we're making are all neutrons. Now that's interesting because we started with one neutron, but now in the process of this, this uh, process here, or, or this reaction, we're making three neutrons. Well, what do you think those three neutrons will do? Well, they're all going to go back and find other uranium-235 atoms and repeat the process. They're going to hit three more uranium-235 atoms, and they're going to basically triple the process. Now, when that happens, you'll have nine neutrons produced. And, and what do you think those nine neutrons will do? Well, they'll go, they'll go back and do the same thing. This is what's called a chain reaction. And so, this is a reaction that basically sustains itself. And this is why it's very important in a nuclear power plant to slow down these neutrons because if you're not careful, this chain reaction can get out of hand. And if you have, you know, 3 into 9, into 27, into 81, uh, into 243, and so on, eventually this can replicate itself so quickly that you can have what's called a nuclear meltdown. And that's if you don't slow down the neutrons. And so that's what uh, you want to avoid if you have a nuclear power plant, is a nuclear meltdown. Well, the chain reaction is what takes place in a nuclear power plant and uh, if regulated and if, if kept to a, to a normal speed uh, can be harnessed for nuclear power. Let's talk about another application of nuclear energy and that's nuclear fusion. And this is the exact opposite of nuclear fission. This is where we take very small nuclei and they combine to form a heavier, more stable nucleus. And so this is the exact opposite. This is where we take very small atoms, usually hydrogen, and we put them together 
to make something that's larger. So there are some examples of fusion that you may be familiar with. For example, in the sun and stars, this is probably uh, the most common process in the universe. The fact that we're taking, um, well, not, not we, but the fact that in, in stars, hydrogen is being fused into helium. <coughs> and so this process is very common. It produces a huge amount of energy. Uh, in fact, so much energy that uh, it's, it's very difficult for us to replicate this on the Earth. In fact, when we do, what usually produces is what's called a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear bomb. And this is a case where very briefly, for just a few seconds or even less than that, nuclear fusion is taking place. And the, the power that's released is so destructive, it is very, very huge. Well, the temperature that's produced when nuclear fusion uh, uh, happens in the core of the sun is somewhere on the order of 10 to 50 million degrees. Now, that's a huge temperature. It's a very high temperature. In fact, it's so hot that if you had a grain of sand that was at that temperature, 10 to 50 million uh, degrees, it would cook everything within a 90-mile radius of it. So we're talking about a very... A high temperature. That's why it's very difficult for us to replicate this in a controlled way on the Earth. And so this is the reaction that's taking place in nuclear fusion uh, usually. So we have four hydrogen atoms, normal hydrogen atoms, and they are fusing together. And so they are smashed together at a very, very high rate of speed. And when that happens, we make one helium atom and two positrons. You might remember those are the, that's the symbol for a positron and energy. And this is the extremely high temperature. So that's somewhere, uh, as we said, on the order of 10 to 50 million degrees Celsius. So that's that's nuclear fusion. Well, let's talk about some uses of nuclear energy. Some other applications. We already talked about how it can be used for electricity, and that's the fission process. And as we said, this, this usually requires uranium and a very specific isotope of uranium, uranium-235. And as it turns out, that's not the most common isotope of uranium uh, that's found in the Earth. The most common isotope of uranium is actually uranium-238. And so we have uranium-238 and uranium-235. Those are the two main isotopes of uranium that we're interested in. And normally, in the Earth's crust, or if you were to find uranium in a mine, uh, as it turns out, only about, maybe, if we're lucky, about 0.5% of that uranium would be uranium-235. About 99.5% of it would be the uranium-238. Well, unfortunately, that ratio of uranium is not very useful for us, and so we can't really do much with that. And so this uranium undergoes what's called the enrichment process. Now, this is where, essentially, uh, a gaseous diffusion uh, process takes place, and a very uh, high amount of the uh, uranium-238 is essentially sucked out of there. And so it bumps up the ratio from 0.5% to about 4%. And when you have about 4% of your uranium-235 uh, atoms present, uh, then you can actually use that for nuclear power. And that can be shipped off to nuclear power plants. There aren't that many places in the country or in the world that uh, are able to do this process of enrichment. One of those places was very close to us in uh, Paducah, Kentucky. And so that's uh, perhaps a place that some of you have heard of, the uh, USEC facility where they did this gaseous diffusion and enrichment of uranium. Uh, officially, they, they did not uh, use this process to create uranium for nuclear uh, uh, bombs back in the 40s and 50s because, generally speaking, it would require a much higher percentage than 4% to make a bomb out of it. Usually it's said maybe somewhere in the 90% range to make a bomb out of that. So it is usually used for electricity. Now, another very uh, good use of uh, 
nuclear energy is in, is in medicine. And so we use various radioactive isotopes as a radiation therapy for cancer. Perhaps you've heard of a, of a loved one or someone else who's undergone this type of radiation therapy where they basically uh, bombard a tumor with huge amounts of radiation to kill those cancer cells. Sometimes radioactive isotopes are used for diagnosis as well. Uh, perhaps you've uh, had to uh, have an MRI or some other uh, diagnostic procedure where you've had to, to take some sort of a, a disgusting uh, milkshake, or uh, what looks like a milkshake, but it's actually a, a barium solution. And you drink this, it has a f fairly short half-life, and it does its thing inside your body where the MRI or the other diagnostic instrument is able to see uh, your soft tissue, like your intestines or your stomach, and maybe diagnose if there's something wrong with you. So radioactive isotopes are very useful for this, and they're able to allow us to make uh, diagnoses that were just very difficult to make even a few uh, decades ago. Now here's another use of nuclear energy that we've talked about here in passing, and that's for warfare. Uh, normally, uh, we, this is not a very uh, enjoyable uh, idea to talk about, but nuclear bombs are uh, an application of nuclear energy. Uh, they've only been used a, a, a couple of times, and that was during World War II, uh, at the end of that war in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Of course, the nuclear bombs that are available today are much, much more destructive than those original uh, bombs. A very good use of nuclear energy is in scientific research. And if you've looked at a periodic table recently, you've noticed that the number of elements has been expanding over the years. And so today we have 118 elements. We've, we've made uh, something on the order of about 24, or rather 28, I believe, new elements, artificial elements. And it requires nuclear energy in order to do this. And when we carry out these, these uh, processes, we're actually discovering the fundamentals of the universe. We're, we're basically trying to understand the processes that help to create the universe and what the opening moments of the universe could have been like. Now, let's talk about the effects of radiation for a few minutes. Uh, as far as we know, there is no such thing as a radiation gun where you can be shot with a certain uh, dose of radiation. But uh, if there were, we would measure these uh, effects of radiation in what's called REM. R-E-M, pronounced REM, stands for radiation effect for man. R-E-M, radiation effect uh, for man. And so this is basically measuring the effect of radiation on you. And if we could somehow shoot a person with up to 25 REM of radiation, as far as we know, there would be no observable effect on that person. And so it just wouldn't do anything to them. In fact, we'd have to shoot them with quite a bit more in order to, to see an actual effect. If you were to shoot someone with, say, upwards of 25 up to about 100 rim, you'd notice a temporary decrease of white blood cells in the person. And from your studies of biology, perhaps you've learned that, that white blood cells are what are used uh, to help us fight off disease. Uh, they're part of our immune system. And so if you had a decrease of white blood cells, the person would be more susceptible to getting sick. And so at this level of radiation, you might find someone is more susceptible to getting a cold or coming down with the flu or, or some other uh, minor illness. Now, if we up the dosage even higher, up to about 100 to 200 rem, somewhere in that range, then we start to notice what's called acute radiation sickness. And this is where the person actually gets to be visibly ill from the effects of the radiation. So what you'd see is the person would start to lose their appetite. Uh, and if they were able to eat anything, they probably wouldn't be able to keep it down, to be honest. They'd feel very weak, very lethargic, just symptoms of uh, diarrhea, very severe headache, um, a vomiting if they're able to eat anything, like I said. So this is a very severe acute radiation sickness. Once we get over 200 rem, then we start to see 
uh, cases where people would probably not uh, survive that. That's where they'd have probably loss of hair or even uh, death. And so these are the effects of radiation. Now, I have a question for you. If we, we have all these effects, how many REM is the average American exposed to in a typical year? And so think about that for a second. Do you think it's 100 REM? 200 rem, is it 5 rem? I've had students that have said uh, 10,000 rem. How many rem do you think the average American is exposed to in a typical year? Now, a lot of this depends on where you live and uh, what you're exposed to, but over millions of people, the average American is exposed to about, you might be surprised here, it's about 0 0.15 rem or about 150 millirem, as it turns out. So this is a very, very small amount. Now, where does this radiation come from? Well, a very large part of it is from the sun and stars and, the, and, and outer space, cosmic rays. In fact, we can say over a third of our typical radi radiation exposure comes from the sky, essentially, 35%. Here's another source that may be surprising to you. About 18% of our radiation exposure comes from people. People are a little bit radioactive. As we said uh, in an earlier lecture, everything that is alive and never has been alive uh, has carbon in it. And some atoms of carbon are radioactive. And so, yes, people are a little bit radioactive. The Earth. The Earth is filled with radioactive isotopes. And some of those isotopes... Uh, or some of that radiation eventually gets to us and, and affects us a little bit. So 17%. These are all natural sources of radiation that really almost nobody uh, can avoid. If you add these three numbers together, 35 plus 18 plus 17, you'll find that about 70% of your typical radiation exposure in a year comes from these natural sources. And you can't really um, avoid those very easily. Now, the next few are artificial sources. These are from man-made sources. About 20% of your typical radiation exposure comes from x-rays. So medical x-rays, dental x-rays. This is a, a fairly high percentage, uh, considering that most people don't get x-rays every day. Most people only get a couple of these every year. So it's possible that in maybe one or two sittings, you could get a fairly high percentage of your radiation exposure. Just getting a, a few of these is not going to hurt you, but this does explain why the x-ray technician walks out of the room. The technician doesn't want to be exposed to hundreds or thousands of these things over the course of a year. Air travel about 5%. That's usually explained because the airplane travels at a higher level of the atmosphere than what most of us are used to. And so we're closer to uh, the cosmic rays and the sun's rays uh, when you're traveling in an airplane. Here's, here's a, another uh, percentage here. Nuclear waste and weapons, about 4%. And so if you add these together, that's about 29%. So this doesn't add up to 100. The other 1% might come from other sources, like a television set or a microwave oven. To be honest, TV sets and microwave ovens are not significant sources of ionizing radiation. And so these are the main sources of radiation. And this uh, discussion has hopefully helped us to understand different uh, sources of radiation that Americans are exposed to and all people are exposed to in a typical year and some important applications of nuclear energy.